I Chose You, a sermon delivered by Dr. Rob Blackburn on November 10th, 2013 at Central United Methodist Church in Asheville, North Carolina. Our passage for this morning comes from John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. Hear now the word of our Lord. This is Jesus speaking. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. If I do not call you servant, I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I was appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. David Duncan wrote this interesting book called The River Why, and the uh, key character is a man named Gus. Gus is a restless seeker. And he has a fisher friend named Nick, and Nick is one of those persons who just has this palpable kind of serenity and peace about his life, and he wants to know more about who Nick is and his story. So he just thinks, I'll get him started. He says, look, I see this, this big scar you got in the palm of your hand. Tell me the story of the scar. Nick said, I'll tell you. I was on a Navy ship in World War II. We were off the coast of Norway and hit a mine and within a few moments, um, I wasn't on the ship anymore. I was floating alone without a life preserver in that, that cold North Sea. And I looked up at the crest of the next wave, and I could see this large, heavy trawler bearing down upon me. And there was a man out on the deck, and he was bellowing something at me. And he had a big fishing tackle and rod in his hands, and he's bellowing at me, and he cast and I could see the lion whisking in the sun it goes over my head and it's coming toward me and I get my hands around it but the water is so cold I, I can't grab hold of it. it's just sliding and sliding and finally got to this and at this point he pulls out from his shirt what is on a chain and it's a heavy gauge five inch fish hook and he said I got to the end of the line and there it was I knew it was my last chance. Now you can imagine what he's going to get ready to do. He said he, he opened the palm of his hand and poof. He said the pain pierced into my hand and through my arms and I was pulled under the waves and out of the wave and then I woke up in the galley of that trawler uh, puking up seawater. He said, Nick, my life has never been the same since my hand got pierced. Saving help unlooked for in the form of a fish hook. I don't know if you'd call me religious or not, but things have changed between me and God. And then he opened the palm of his hand and you could see it, the depth and the redness of the scar and the firelight. And he said, behold the sign, he said, Behold the sign of the fisher's love for a wooden-headed ass. <laughs> it's a little bit like the story of these fisher folks. They were going about their business, and Jesus breaks into their life and gets his hook into their souls. And at some risk, and probably not sure about what they were doing or why, they grabbed a hold of the hook, and the life their life was never the same again. So now you see we're reading about these, these men who had got hooked by the divine fishermen. They're, they're farther along in their journey. This is in the 15th chapter of John. And now Jesus is letting them kind of know where they're all at in this together. And he uses some good, strong, and rich metaphors. He said, uh, you're the branches, and I'm the vine. You're part of a vine that is going to give so much nourishment to you that you're going to grow over and around and through one another. Do you become a canopy that bears much fruit? And then he says, you know, things change. We've grown in this together. I, 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 I'm, I no longer will call you servant. The name for you is friend. Because he says servants, they, they, they will not know what the master is doing, but 
but you do. Sounds like a promotion, doesn't it? Uh, out of the cabin to the big house, out of the field and to the patio, off the floor and to the big bed. Everything that I've heard from the Father, Jesus said, you, you've heard from me. I, I've let you in on the whole operation. That's the promotion. Of course, once you're in, there is responsibility with that. And then Jesus, after promoting them from servant to friend, he takes them back in time to how they all got started. And he said, you remember, don't you? It wasn't so much that you chose me. I came along and chose you. Could we stop and just freeze those three words, just mid-frame for a moment? I, I chose you. There are hours, there are days, there are seasons in our lives that, that no words um, are, are more significant. Those are the very words we are waiting for and the words we need to hear. I, I have to think about what it must have meant to these ordinary folks. They were spending another day um, down the docks um, of their town there in Capernaum, mending the nets, uh, putting pitch and tar on the bow of the boat. And here comes this man, this rabbi from Nazareth, the light of eternity in his eyes. He doesn't make an announcement over a public address system. This isn't a vague general announcement. Anybody who's interested, come and sign up. No, he steps up one by one, looks them in the face, and calls them by name and says, I choose you. You know, I, I, hear, um, I hear people say things like this at times. Well, I, I just want to be my own person. I, well, I understand that. I mean, not, none of us wants to be pushed around and controlled and overwhelmed by the demands of others. But I would suggest that in a deeper sense, none of us finally want to be just our own person. We, we long to hear the voice of another calling, summoning in us, valuing our life enough to lay a claim upon it. If you don't think that's true, just remember where I was back in the neighborhood games, picking up teams, and maybe you're one of the younger kids that's out there, and you're hearing the names getting chosen, picked, and the great fear you have down in your gut is your name will not be called. I think most of us, we all got stories, and I, I think a lot of us have some story along the line of not being chosen. Maybe, you know, back in school, or kid not chosen for the glee club, later in life, not chosen for the job, the promotion, the relationship. You know, that, that, um, that carries a blunt message. Not sure I'm useful, not sure I'm worthy. We don't take it easy, we don't take it lying down, not at first. I mean, when we get that message, we haven't been chosen. I mean, sometimes we go out there and we just try to get our hands on. We try to borrow recognizable identity from someone. I mean, look at the fanatic football fan, vicariously living into the identification. Or how about um, the persona of the bully? No decorum, no rules. I'll just push, pull, and make a lot of noise and... Um, that will compel notice. I mean, these strategies work well, extremely well. Problem is they don't have a very long shelf life. So over against that backdrop, not being recognized, being ignored, uh, indistinguishable in the background. Think what it means to have someone of significance say those three words. I choose you. Jesus, one with the light of eternity in his eyes. He didn't just say that to a few people a long time ago. Oh, and there's no like little mathematical formula that says, well, you know, there's only so many chosen, so many elect. There, there, there's some little narrow theologies that says, you know, God has this. He knows how many are going to be chosen. How? Oh, come on. We're talking about the grace of God. Put your calculators away. Our spiritual math collapsed before that. What did Jesus say to the disciples? You've been chosen by now. You know what your job is? To go into the world and let the whole world know of their chosenness. Yeah. Jesus still steps out of that frame called history. And the one who knows us best and cherishes us most fully draws near. And says, everything that I've heard from the Father, it's yours. I'm going to tell you about it. And oh, by the way, I'm giving you an assignment. 
in my joyful kingdom, chosen. Oh, and this isn't some kind of last minute thing like God feels sorry for you or uh, thinks nobody else would ever take you like you're stray mud at the dog pound. <laughs> no. Um, what does scripture say? Chosen before the laying of the foundations of the world. Chosen. I mean, you were in on the action before you knew you were in on the action. You're cosmic. That's, that's what it means. You're chosen. Oh, but there's something else where we have to listen to it. It's kind of intriguing to me to think about. Jesus says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. But wait a minute, don't we say yes? Don't we make our choice? Yes, we do. But do you see what Jesus is saying there? The impetus, the initiative, the energy is from the Godward side. The whole gospel story of our chosenness isn't so much about a bunch of human beings figuring this out and working their way to God. This is about the restless seeking God coming to us. That's the way the biblical narrative has been from the beginning. When our parents, Adam and Eve, left the garden, right? God came and whispered something in their ear. Do you remember what God said? I'm coming after you. Oh, they didn't hear that, though, as a promise. They heard it as a threat. So they started running. And we've been running ever since, hiding, hiding in shopping sprees, you know, hiding in travel, hiding in the wild pursuit of Strength and power, hiding in bad relationships, hiding in church sometimes. You know, church isn't a bad place to try to hide from God. When I was in theology school, there was this national campaign. Oh, it had bumper stickers and there were billboards all over the country. It was called the I Found It campaign. You know, I found God, right? I always thought it got the whole, whole story backwards. I found God. Oh, I guess we do search for God. But human beings, we usually search in the wrong places. And what we come up with is another idol, another little God of our sweet concoction. A lot of times, trying to find our way to God, we're just really trying to avoid God. The gospel isn't, I found anything. The gospel is, we've been found. Yeah. So much of the New Testament, the energy isn't just people coming to Jesus, but Jesus coming to them. Jesus didn't sit around and wait for people to figure out that they were lacking something significant in life. He instigated, he initiated, he infiltrated human life and turned things upside down. And so Jesus says, do you catch this? You didn't choose me, I chose you. You know, that's been my experience as a Christian. Jesus isn't someone I grasp. Jesus is someone who grasps me. Yeah. Hmm. What does any and all of this have to do with All Saints Sunday? I think it has a lot to do. I mean, who are the saints? The saints aren't the perfect. The saints aren't the infinitely wise. It's the saints are the people. They've heard the good news and they've accepted their chosenness. It's ordinary people, people like James and John, Peter and Andrew, that figured out that Jesus was choosing not to save the world all by himself. Jesus wasn't going to be God alone. Jesus, the great delegator. And I'm sure as Jesus was handing out those assignments, he knew half the time this would be a role too big for us to fulfill. But Jesus didn't lower the bar. No, he kept saying, come after me, follow me, live into me. He kept the bar high, knowing that the only way we would succeed is by working with each other and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Who are the saints? I mean, there are people like you and me who have come to the point that we believe that Jesus knew what he was doing when he delegated it all to us. It's hard for us to believe that at times. God's seeing more in us than we see. I, I know there are moments when we, we say, you know, God, you really should have gotten somebody else for this job. Um, yes, I have my limitations. Um, yes, these shoes are going to be too big for me to fill at times. And yes, I have my doubts, my fears, and my hesitations. But the saints are the people that believe that God knows what God is doing. Yeah. So God chose to work through a group of fisher folks. 
And they accepted their chosenness. And he got his hook into them, and they grabbed a hold of it. And their lives were never the same again. Did they get it right? Oh, a lot of times it didn't come close. I mean, sometimes, I mean, Jesus needed them like he needed a Holden's head. I mean, sometimes the biggest enemies of Jesus are his so-called followers. Uh, no, they didn't get it right. Not a lot of the time, but they kept following, and Jesus kept shining through. So here's the question I want to put before you. What would the world be like today if, if Jesus hadn't invited the likes of them? Um, if Jesus hadn't included the likes of them in the work of his kingdom? You know, on the G day Jesus died, that little group really hadn't stirred up much, had they? You know, if you and I, let's just pretend we're there on the J day that Jesus died and you look around the world, what would you see? The headlines would be Roman Empire. Pax Romana, 250,000 miles of paved road. Pax Romana. Decades, it really even centuries of Mediterranean dominance and power. And then we got this little gaggle of friends in a locked room called disciples. They're bewildered and confused. Now, if somebody came along and said, where are you going to put your money? Where, where, where are you going to wager your money on who's going to be around 2,000 years later? Roman Empire or that little group of disciples? I'd have put my money on the Roman Empire, which now is as extinct as the dodo bird. Maybe God knows what God is doing. Who are the saints? To be a saint, friends, you don't have to be perfect, and you don't have to be famous. <laughs> you don't even have to be dead. You just have to be one of those who has been surprised by Jesus and you let that hook get in your soul and you grab a hold of it. Oh, you better grab a hold of it because the minute you say yes, well, you're going to be given a job and the joyful communion of saints. What a celebration it is today. Speaking of celebration, Tom Long talks about being in a hotel in New York City. He had been speaking there, lecturing, and pretty nice hotel and he checks in the desk and he goes over to the elevator kind of like the door where he goes to the elevator and there is a handwritten sign there on the elevator and the handwritten sign was very intriguing the handwritten sign said party tonight room 210 everybody invited oh so long thought he was he was kind of interested you know he kind of pictured some of the people that would come a, a sales rep who was tired of the tedium of road a Maybe a young couple had been on a romantic getaway and um, they were tired of just being with each other. And maybe some teenagers who would slip away from the parents to go find out what was happening in room 210. Maybe some hotel employees, a little wary, not wanting you know, their boss to see them, but finding out about the party in 210. Well, Long goes down to um, the restaurant in the hotel for supper and alas, when he's going back to get on the elevator to go back upstairs, somebody's taken down the handwritten sign. And now it's been replaced with a real nice typewritten sign. You could see it had been put there by the hotel management. And now the sign says, there will be no party in room 210. The entire invitation was a hope. But Long said for a few moments, everyone in that hotel was tantalized by the thought that there's a party going on somewhere <laughs> to which everybody's been invited. doesn't matter who you are when you get there or what got you there. What matters is what happened after you arrived. Folks, if anybody's going to throw a party like that, it's going to have to be us, the church. Oh, and guess what? That's the party you're a part of today. It's called the communion of saints. Why are you looking so glum? You're, you're, you're here to party today. You've been invited. Your name is on the list. And well, as all these persons who have gone into the eternal communion, oh, and all those other people, James and Peter and John and Andrew and Desmond Tutu and Teresa de Avila and Francis of Assisi and Patrick of Ireland, they're all 
here together with us. It's like they're in the grandstand we can't see and they're praying for us, encouraging us and egging us on. What a party. Jesus said, you're no longer, um, you're no longer going to be called servants. You're friends. And remember, remember how it all started. Uh, you didn't choose me. I chose you.